series, Things I Wish Jesus Never Said. I was watching a uh, news uh, talk show, and uh, they were interviewing a pastor who was doing a five-week series called Pure Sex. And people in the audience were asking, uh, you know, you know, what he was doing and why, and one young woman was put off that... Uh, a uh, church would think they have anything to say to the community about sex. She said, it seems like, me, to me, like the church is a really inappropriate place to address this subject. You know, maybe you're an unbeliever, and you wonder how the church would have anything to say about sex. Sometimes we're embarrassed to talk about the subject, a uh, professor, young professor at a women's college was asked to teach a course on uh, sex education. And he was a little uncomfortable telling his wife that he was doing this, so he said he was doing a class on sailing. <laughs> what do you know about sailing? She, you know. He says, don't worry, I've read up on it. Well, on the first uh, day of the semester, the, uh, the, the wife happened to be on campus when the sex education class was letting out, and a young woman came out, and she said, oh, your husband is so good on this subject. And she laughed. She said, well, I don't know how he could be. He's only done it twice. <laughs> first time he got sick, and the second time he lost his hat. <clears throat> Why would someone think that the church would have nothing to say about sex? Maybe it's because all we've been saying is it's wrong. Don't do it. People think all the church has to offer is shame and judgment. But we have so much more. We have a message that God is good. Everything he created is good. I mean, he's the one who created sex and made it enjoyable. We also have to speak about sex if we're going to be relevant. I mean, sex and sexual messages are everywhere. On our cell phones, uh, internet, TV, movies, magazine. The Kaiser Family Fa Foundation uh, study found that the number of sex scenes on television has doubled in the last 15 years. When we're fed a steady diet of casual sex, ultimately we begin to accept it as the norm. For the church not to speak out about God's design for sex is to cut people, particularly teenagers, adrift in tumultuous waters. This is the fifth in a series of messages, Things I Wish Jesus Never Said. And today we're going to look at what Jesus said when he said, You shall not commit adultery. He speaks about sex, lust, divorce. I mean, it's a text loaded with difficult subject matter. I mean, it's a minefield. Makes me feel like I should just read the text and then close in prayer. Be done with it. Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. Jewish rabbis in the first century were expected to speak about the Old Testament law. Now, Jesus has three choices. He can reject, uh, uh, and he deals with uh, the Old Testament law in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. Now, he has three choices. He can reject the law as outdated. He can accept one of the interpretive groups of his day. Uh, he can go with the Sadducees. Uh, all, the only interpretation they care about is that which keeps them in power. He can go with the Pharisees. They're self-righteous and legalistic. He can go with the Essenes. They're quirky and weird. Or he can go with the Zealots. They are the radical terrorists of Jesus' day. Jesus chooses to go a third way. He doesn't reject the law. He treats it with highest respect. Um, neither does he take a legalistic approach and say, you can't do this, can't do that. Instead, he chooses a third way. He speaks about the heart of the law. Why did God give it? In each of the commands that are mostly stated in the negative, he finds a grand positive. So, you shall not commit murder is stated negatively, and he says the grand positive is to respect all life, to treat people with the highest honor. You shall not commit adultery is, is stated negatively. 
He says the grand positive is to honor your spouse and hold marriage in high honor. Now we're ready to hear what Jesus says about sex and marriage. Let's stand in honor of God's word. You have heard that it was said, this is Jesus speaking, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. So this is another thing I wish Jesus had never said. Are you kidding me? Gouge out your eye? It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Are you serious, Jesus? Could have you said anything more difficult for us to talk about? Lord Jesus, thank you for your words. Help us to understand what you mean and apply it to our lives today. We're ready to hear from you in Jesus' name. Amen. So what does Jesus mean? How can we live in purity in a sex-crazed culture? Uh, how do we cultivate marriages that last? Uh, this message is relevant to every one of us. Some of you are teenagers and wondering how God wants you to deal with sex. Some of you are married. You need to strengthen your marriage and your sex life within your marriage. Uh, some are single, but may be married someday. Some of you are single with no plans to get married. You may be asked to give advice. All of us can benefit from hearing what Jesus has to say about how we can avoid falling prey to lust, adultery, and divorce and build great marriages. A great marriage is worth all the effort it takes. You ever seen one of these Guinness World Book of Records uh, uh, demonstrations with dominoes? person knocks one domino over and like 300,000 dominoes go down, each one doing its thing. I think that's what Jesus does here. Nobody gets married with the idea that I'll have an affair and get a divorce. So how does it happen? The first domino to drop that destroys a marriage is a bad attitude. Uh, there's a trigger that happens in marriage even before lust and it starts with the attitude. Prophet Malachi gives us God's counsel to couples when he says, guard yourself in your spirit. He says, don't let a bad attitude develop towards your mate. Last week we saw Jesus say that uh, we're supposed to get rid of anger in our relationships. It starts with something your spouse does that bugs you, like not putting the cap back on the toothpaste or not cleaning up after himself. You get irritated and then, you know, you're bugged and, and a contempt builds towards your partner. There are little digs that start happening as your disgust grows. A couple was celebrating their 15th wedding anniversary and the husband asked the wife, where would you like to go? She says, take me someplace I've never been. He says, how about the kitchen? <laughs> Believe me, that was not a happy anniversary. <laughs> when you start hearing digs between a couple, one thing you can know for sure, there's not much romance going on in that marriage. How can couples resolve conflicts that inevitably arise in marriage? In a word, grace. Grace enables us to forgive when things go wrong. Uh, marriages always face crises, and when things are frayed, that's not the time to break up a marriage. That's when we need God's grace to heal us and to grant forgiveness. Apostle Paul writes, read this with me. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Jesus died for all sins, so you can forgive your mate. Your mate may have done terrible things that hurt you. God forgives him or her, 
and you need to as well. A marriage can't survive without forgiveness and grace. Some of you have held on to anger towards your partner for so long, it's killing you and killing your marriage. An attitude of anger or contempt trips the first domino, and the second domino to fall is lust. When conflicts go unresolved in a marriage, mates begin detaching themselves. Uh, excessive TV watching. Husband uh, goes out to the garage for hours. The wife gets lost in a romance novel. Uh, the wife goes out with the gals, or the husband goes out with the guys. Uh, when a marriage is unsatisfying or there's a lack of sexual intimacy, mates become vulnerable and start noticing neighbors or uh, co-workers who look interesting. This is when lust worms its way in and men might be tempted to check out a pornographic site or women uh, explore chat rooms or porn sites. A 60-year-old husband was walking with his 60-year-old wife on the beach and he accidentally kicked a bottle. So he reached down and he, he rubbed it and a genie popped out. I'll grant you any wish you want. What is it? And he looks at his wife and he says, I'd like to have a wife who looks uh, is like 30 years younger than me. He says, sorry, honey. And uh, Jeannie says, no problem. And poof, the husband was turned into a 90-year-old man. <clears throat> Be careful what you ask for. Okay, read this with me. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You know, most people read this, pat themselves on the back and say, you know, I haven't committed adultery. I'm good. But Jesus knows you can violate this commandment without taking any clothes off. Some of you may be considering adultery. You don't actually use the word, but you're watching the bait go by. Watch out. Lust is the second domino that destroys a marriage. So how can we win the battle over lust? The answer lies in another word, truth. Here's the truth according to Jesus and the Bible. I want you to read this with me. Sex is a gift from God that is good. And we find the greatest enjoyment and satisfaction in sex if we save it for and limit it to marriage. God's design is that sexual intimacy should occur between one man and one woman in a marriage relationship. Now that truth is different from what we see on television shows and movies. 94% of sexual activity in TV and movies occurs between unmarried people. A gross distortion of real life where most sexual activity happens between a married couple. Movies and TV shows show us that sex before marriage, outside of marriage, or between people of the same sex is perfectly acceptable and quite normal and far more satisfying than sex within a marriage. Experts say this message is fantasy, not fact. The truth is we're being sold a pack of lies. A survey titled Sex in America, a definitive survey, interviewed 3,432 people. That's a big sample. And found that married couples have the highest rate of sexual satisfaction, 88%. Those not married have only a 54% rate of sexual satisfaction. The study also found that married women have a significantly higher rate of sexual satisfaction than single women do. The marriage effect is so dramatic that it swamps all other data, says John Gagnon. State University of New York sociology professor, one of the authors of the study. If we reject Jesus' teaching of the sacredness of sex being reserved for marriage, we will bring an end to our civilization. Indiscriminate sexual activity hurts individuals as well as society as a whole. We now have documentation to prove it. Anthropologist J.D. Unwin conducted an exhaustive study of the 88 civilizations that have existed since our world began. He found that 
they all have a sort of a similar life cycle. They begin with a strict sexual code of conduct, and they end with a permissiveness that allows uh, passion and sex for, for anybody. Unwin reports that every society that has extended sexual permissiveness to his people was soon to perish. He says there have been no exceptions, zero exceptions. Folks, that is game, set, and match. An attitude of bitterness trips the first domino. The second domino to fall is lust. Then the third one falls, adultery. All right, Cody, come on up here. Uh, this is Cody Seiler, six foot four, basketball phenom at Tigard High School. He can dribble, he can drive, he can dunk, he can. Uh, now, give me a soft three point touch. I'm putting those up. Um, he can shoot from the outside, three pointers. He can rebound, he can uh, block shots, he does it all. All right, so here's what we have here, Cody. So the first domino that destroys a marriage is a bad attitude, like anger towards your mate. S second one is lust. It leads to kind of looking around. Third one is adultery. We actually have an affair. The fourth one we're going to find is divorce. And we're not going to go that far today, but the fifth one is destroying children, the family. And the sixth one is you destroy the whole civilization. All right? All right, trip the first one see what happens. Wow, way to go, man. All right, nice job. <clears throat> Jesus says, fool around with pornography long enough or inappropriate sex uh, uh, friendships with the opposite sex and you'll get tripped up by adultery. I was a psychology major at Lewis and Clark College, and I studied uh, anthropologist Margaret Mead. She wrote a book in 1928, uh, it was a report of her study of people in Samoa. She said that the people of Samoa practiced free sex, sex with anyone, liberal uh, attitude towards sex, and communal care of children, and all without any psychic or sociological uh, problems. Well, fellow psychologists and sociologists hailed her work as a, a new breakthrough, new morality that sets us free from the restrictions of Judeo-Christian culture. Well, since then, even though this, that, that book has been re read, probably by some of you, uh, many college students through the years have had that as an assigned text, uh, her work has been uh, discredited as a wholesale deception. Anthropologist Derek Freeman uh, did a study and he finds no uh, sexual license in modern Christian Samoa or in its pagan past. She said, uh, he said that Mead's work was, uh, was wrong because of her inadequate language training and her wishful thinking. She was trying to assuage a guilty conscience from her own divorce and two adulterous affairs, one with a man and one with a woman. So how do we avoid adultery? Jesus tells us it takes self-control. Uh, he tells us that since sex in marriage is so good, we must take decisive action to protect it. Now I think we can better understand what Jesus meant in Matthew 5. Would you read this with me? If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. You say, whoa, what is so serious about sexual purity that Jesus uh, would, would go for the jugular here? And why doesn't he speak with such vehemence about cheating and lying? And gossip. Uh, Jesus uses some of the most violent language he ever used to talk about sexual purity, to separate ourselves from even a sliver of sexual sin. He speaks very seriously about sexual purity because it's important to him and his design for sex in the world, and it's important to us. Apostle Paul sets sexual purity in a league of its own when he says, flee from sexual immorality. 
All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Now, teenager, this will go against everything you see in the media. But I'm telling you, you need to learn self-control in this area while you're young. You know, some people think, you know, it's no big deal because if I get married, then I'll have an outlet for sex and, and then I, the problem will be gone. No, if you don't learn self-control while you're young, that'll go right with you into your marriage and imperil your marriage. So what does Jesus suggest we do to be pure? Some people whose zeal has exceeded their wisdom have gouged out their eye or cut off their hand. Jesus is not meant to be taken literally. Jesus means we are to live as if we don't have an eye or we don't have a hand. Um, he knows that you can gouge out your eye, cut off your hand, and still have a lustful heart. Jesus means that if we're plagued by lust, discipline yourself to live as if you don't have an eye to look at uh, sexual content on your cell phone or your computer or in movies or TV. Man, if we're going to gain victory over lust, we must discipline our eyes. Job writes, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. You remember Aaron Ralston? Now, he was the uh, mountain climber in eastern Utah who um, a, a, a thousand pound boulder uh, landed on his uh, hand and he couldn't, he, couldn't get, he couldn't get away. After two days, he ran out of water. After five days, he, put a, he tied a tourniquet around his bicep and pulled out his pocket knife and cut off his arm just below the elbow. Then he repelled down and climbed out of the uh, canyon uh, to where rescuers were hunting for him. You say, man, how could a guy cut off his arm? Well, they asked him that and he said, I knew if I just stayed there, I was going to die. If he could take such drastic measures on his own body so he could live some more years or a few more decades, we can take drastic action with our self-discipline in this whole area for, to guard our soul for eternity. Jesus says if we want to claim purity, we have to take decisive action as to what we look at. There's an uh, airport in, in Europe, international airport, and there's a coffee shop there, a restaurant, and, and people sit there. And uh, the problem they have is that um, people were nursing their coffees far too long, waiting for their flights, and so their tables were always full. So they talked as a staff about what are we going to do about this, and I'm sure the, the natural you know, first ideas were, well, let's put in uncomfortable chairs, Let's, let's, let's have a charge, you know, if you're, if you're here too long or let's bust the tables faster and give them the idea, you know, we want you out of here. But the idea they ultimately came up with is turn off the, 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 the flight monitor. Well, then people will be worried that they you know, might miss their flight and they, and they left sooner. And then when their tables are cleared out, they, they turn the monitor back on and then they get new customers that's what Jesus is saying here. You have to turn off the sexual stimuli coming into your life. Maybe that means stopping cable TV. Maybe it means putting uh, controls on your cell phone or your, your computer. I asked I ask Chris about what, 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 they, what, what we have nowadays, and he suggested, uh, oh, I'm going to forget it, CovenantEyes.com and uh, XXXChurch.com. We should think in terms, when we think about this whole area of, of, of self-control uh, sexually, uh, think in terms of eternity. Think, when you're about to cave in morally, think 10 years out or 20 years or 100 years. What impact is your action going to have on your mate or your children or your Christian testimony? Can you imagine what it would be like if we learned to live with purity so no one ever looked at a woman lustfully? Sexual harassment would disappear from the workplace, from our schools. Marriages would flourish. 80% of divorces would never occur. 
Imagine if we could live in purity. So anger and contempt trip the first domino. That leads to looking around, lust. Then it leads to the act of adultery, which causes the fourth domino to fall that destroys marriage, divorce. It's not by chance that Jesus deals with divorce, having dealt with anger in the heart, lustful looks, and adultery. It's horrible when the divorce domino falls, beginning with non-loving attitudes, leading to non-loving looks, leading to non-loving acts. Nothing tears at the fabric of marriage faster than adultery. So read this with me. Here's what Jesus says. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. Unfaithfulness is so serious, says Jesus, it's grounds for divorce. Now, it doesn't mean you have to get a divorce. It, he simply means that the unfaithful partner has broken the marriage vow. Now, let me just add, I, I know many of you have been divorced or, uh, you know, are divorced or, you know, have, have gone through this. And this does not mean you tear up your marriage, you know, because you're married the second or third time. It just means starting now, you live in sexual purity. So how can we avoid divorce? How can we build marriages that last? The answer lies in one final word, effort. Many people get married thinking that God has in this world one perfect person for us to marry. And once you find your soulmate, then you're going to live happily ever after. I mean, marriage will be a breeze. I mean, how could we ever concoct such a myth? Marriages attempt to take two deeply flawed people and bring them together in hopes of building a strong relationship. It takes a massive amount of effort. Now, you can better understand what our Lord means when he says, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He says, don't let your eyes wander. Don't gaze on the other side of the fence. If you want to make your marriage go, concentrate with all that you have on your mate. Teenager, young single, put energy into developing good friendships and relationships with the opposite sex. Don't, you know, think of, uh, you know, a pop-up, sexual pop-up comes on your phone and think, oh, great, I'll open it. Jesus says, no, leave that alone. Delete it. Middle single, same, same story. You, you don't want to get involved in, in, in sexual relationships that are you're just like are casual. You want to save sex for marriage. God's designed for marriage. Unbeliever, now maybe you can understand why the church has always been so strict about saving sex for marriage. It's that good. It's so valuable. It's worth protecting. Parents, teach your son or daughter that a bad attitude can lead to lust, which can lead to adultery, which can end in divorce, and that they need to learn self-control while they're young. All of you, if you've given your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in. Listen to the Holy Spirit. No one cares more about your welfare than the Holy Spirit living in you. He will prompt you. Listen. Married person, whether you're newly married or an empty nester, are you putting effort into your marriage? A great marriage is worth all the effort it takes. Do you hold marriage and sex in marriage in such high honor that you take drastic measures to remove all impure thoughts from your mind? Lord Jesus, thank you for your words. They're tough. You don't give us any wiggle room. You say this is serious stuff. 
not because you're against happiness and enjoyment and love. It's because you know this is so beautiful. It's so good that it needs to be treated in the right way. So help us with that. I want to give you a moment to pray. Every head bowed down. Maybe you're one that struggles in this area. You say, God, I, I see now this is important. I want to change my ways. Help me. Maybe you're one that this is, this is no big deal. You're wondering why I spent a half hour talking about this. Well, because Jesus spends time talking about it. Let's all pray for just a minute.